welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to take a look at this, the Raspberry Pi 500 Plus. This is a brand new Raspberry Pi keyboard computer and it's got an internal SSD and an illuminated mechanical keyboard. Please note that I've been sent this unit by Raspberry Pi and therefore, in line with YouTube requirements, I flag this video as a paid promotion. But Raspberry Pi have had no input to or control over this review. So let's go and take a closer look. Right, here we have our lovely new Pi, so let's release it from its packaging. So I have to get off this outer sleeve, I think, something like this. This just comes off like uh, that. There we are. And then just open the box. Is there a thing down here? Oh, easy in. And wow, this is a, a very different looking Raspberry Pi, isn't it? And uh, let's just try the keyboard. This is a very nice keyboard. And uh, up here, I think, are a couple of tools. We'll come back to those a bit later on. But for now, let's get out the computer itself, which is it feels far more substantial than the previous Raspberry Pi keyboard computers. Talking of which, over here I've got a Raspberry Pi 500. So let's bring in the new 500 Plus. And whilst these computers are clearly related, the 500 Plus is not just heavier, it's also 26 millimeters, just over an inch longer. And the new keyboard does give it a very different, very high quality feel, very different from the original Pi 500. Both computers have got the same system on a chip as a regular Raspberry Pi 5, which is a Broadcom BCM2712, and this is passively cooled with four-arm Cortex-A76 cores clocked at up to 2.4 GHz. And we also have a Video Core 7 GPU. Both machines have Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth 5.0, but whilst the Pi 500 has got 8 GB of memory, the Pi 500 Plus has got 16 gigabytes of low-power DDR4 RAM. And unlike the earlier model, the 500 Plus has got an M.2 slot, and this comes pre-fitted with a 256 gigabyte Raspberry Pi NVMe SSD, and this is pre-installed with Raspberry Pi OS. And so, in summary, the key differences between the 500 and the 500 Plus are 16 rather than 8 gigabytes of RAM, a 256 gigabyte NVMe SSD, and of course, the keyboard. Talking of which, if we have a close-up of one end, we can clearly see its Gatron Blue KS33 low-profile switches. And I think a lot of people will really appreciate the feel of these. These really are very nice keys indeed. It's a really nice feel to this keyboard, and I imagine that some people will choose to mod it. And indeed, one of the tools included is for keycap, replacement. And if you're wondering why would you choose to replace these lovely new keycaps, well I can tell you one reason straight out of the box, which is that the legends on these keys are quite small. Let's compare this to a Raspberry Pi 500 and you'll see they're about the same size, but if I bring in another keyboard, let's just bring this in here, this is the Raspberry Pi 400 made by Raspberry Pi and with significantly bigger key legend as we can see. So I just don't understand why they make small key legends on their new keyboards. This is a pretty fundamental piece of human computer interface design that's gone wrong here. If you are age 50, 60, whatever it is, you need key legends you can see properly. And if they had the bigger legends like this, if you don't need them that big, it doesn't matter at all. But if you do need them, it makes such a difference. I, I'm very surprised they've, they've done this again on the, the 500 plus. Anyway, I don't want to get too negative, and I do like this keyboard. The feel is absolutely fantastic, and it is great to have a keyboard with four full-size cursor arrows. Turning to the back, the connectivity and layout is identical to the Pi 500, and provides us with one Type-A USB 2 port and two Type-A USB 3 ports. And we then have a microSD card slot, and a USB Type-C connector for power, and you would expect to plug in here a Raspberry Pi 5 power adapter. And then we've got two micro HDMI connectors which support up to 4K at 60 frames a second, and yes, it is such a shame, but they're not full-size HDMI. 
And then finally behind this little cover, we've got a 40 pin GPIO connector and on the end, an RJ45 socket for gigabit ethernet. If we go back to the top and then turn the machine over, that'll catch it out. There we go. Underneath there's very little to report on. We've just got some ventilation holes and some feet. And what we don't have here is a small door, a small access panel for the M.2 SSD. And that's why there's a second tool included in the case, which is this. And this is not so a badger can remove its contact lenses. No, this is for opening up the case if you want to change the NVMe SSD. However, with a 256 gigabyte drive pre-fitted, I don't think that many users will be venturing inside the case. Finally, the only thing I've not mentioned is the price, which is $200 for the computer as we've got here, or $220 for a kit, which I presume will bundle a power supply and a mouse. For comparison, the Pi 500 has a recommended retail price of $90, so adding the SSD, an extra 8 gigabytes of RAM, and the mechanical keyboard has pushed the cost up quite a bit. But I imagine that Raspberry Pi's logic here was to make the Pi 500 Plus the highest specification keyboard computer they could possibly deliver. Now, given that a plastic tool is provided, it seemed impolite not to open up the case, and so I removed these five lower case screws, let's put those safely out of the way, and I've gone around the edge of the case with this little tool. I expected I'd have to use this tool, which I normally use to get inside things. I also use it for uh, plastering walls, performing minor surgery, things like that. Very useful tool. But no, this tool was fine. And we can now lift off the keyboard from the Raspberry Pi 500 Plus and see inside, where, as you can see, we've got a very large heatsink. This is a passively cooled system with an extremely large heatsink given the size of the SOC. I imagine that'll work very well. We'll test it out a bit later on. And then here we've got the M.2 SSD. And as we can see whilst what is fitted is a 2230 Raspberry Pi M.2 SSD, the mounting screw could be moved to fit a 2242 and 2260 or the most common 2280 size NVMe SSD. So that's very good indeed. But I think for now that's all we're going to see inside the case. So I'll put the top back on like that. I'll put the screws back in, make sure it's all firmly together, and we'll see how it works. Greetings. I've now connected a Raspberry Pi 5 power supply, a monitor, and a mouse. Hello, and we're all ready for our first boot. And I think it's important to demonstrate the first boot of this computer, as some people may be interested in the Pi 500 Plus as a compact silent home PC, and they want to know how easy it is to set up. And with an SSD with Raspberry Pi OS on it pre-installed, it should be very easy indeed. Note that whilst we do have a power button up here, this is for turning the Pi 500 back on again after it's been turned off, if you see what I mean, and it will initially boot when mains power is first applied. So let's bring up a feed of the HDMI output and turn on the wall socket. There we go. And oh, I can see some LED lighting under the power key. And we've got LEDs doing things across the keyboard as well. Although you probably can't see that very well on camera right now due to the lighting setup I'm currently working under. So we'll come back and look at the LED lighting on the keyboard in the next part of the video. And for now, therefore, we'll zoom up the video output where the Pi is getting on with its first run kind of stuff. And we'll now use the magic of filmmaking to speed on through until something exciting happens. And here we are. This is exciting. We're welcome to the Raspberry Pi desktop. So let's click on next and then continue with the first run wizard, my country and uh, that sort of stuff is all OK. And then next we need to create a local account. So I will do that. And we now need to connect to Wi-Fi. And then make our choice a browser. Both Chromium and Firefox are pre-installed in Raspberry Pi OS. I'll stick with Chromium as the default, but I won't tick this box to uninstall Firefox. I will leave it there as a second browser. And it's now asking if we want to update software. We will choose to do that by clicking on Next. And once again, we'll speed on through as the Pi acquires and digests some data.
And there we are, it's finished. Rather strange characters on the screen, but we'll assume everything is OK and indeed click on OK. And then guess what? Click on Restart. And here we are running Raspberry Pi OS. And guess what? It's telling us there are updates available. Even more updates are available up here. I think we'll uh, wait to install those for a second because in terms of basic setup, that's all there is to it. You may, however, want to go to the menu and make a few changes in preferences. I normally change some appearance settings. There we are. Things are now much easier to see. And we've got various software pre-installed, as we can see here in the menu. We've got LibreOffice. We've got our Chromium and Firefox browsers, the Claws EMR package, VLC Media Player, and even a few games. Right. I said we'd come back and take a look at the keyboard lighting. So I've reduced here the studio lighting levels. And the Pi is currently turned off. And you may be able to see a little red glow under the power key. But if I press the power key and release, it will turn green. You can probably just about see that. And then we'll have something more spectacular in a second. There we are. That's the booting key effect. Very exciting. But we can do more than that, because if we use function and F4, we can cycle various lighting effects. So for example, we can do that. That is obviously fully illuminated. We can do fully illuminated red, fully illuminated lots of different colors, fully illuminated spinning around. There's no answer to that, is there really? And then we've got uh, this one. That seems to be nothing, but you can probably just about see that when I press a key, it turns blue. If I do it again, and I press a key, goes red. Can I maybe just about see under my finger there, it is uh, going red. So uh, there we are. That's the keyboard lighting on the Raspberry Pi 500 Plus. Right, back on the desktop, let's bring up a shot of a power meter, which shows that at idle, we're using about 2.4, 2.5 watts. And we'll leave this on the screen as we run various other tests. The first of which is going to be launching a browser. We'll test out streaming media playback. Let's go to the Christopher Barnett YouTube channel and go to my standard test video. There it is. We should have no problems playing 1080p video, but we'll just make sure, make sure it is 1080p, bring up stats for nerds. And yes, we've got no drop frames as we're looking at these ducks. I wouldn't have expected drop frames. And as we can see, we're using up towards about five watts. It's going around a bit when we're playing streaming media here on the Raspberry Pi 500 plus. So let's leave the ducks and co behind like that. And next, here is a table of test results for my standard Raspberry Pi 5 temperature test script. And it will be good to see how the passively cooled Pi 500 plus compares. So let's open up a terminal like that and run my standard temperature test script. Here we go. And what this does is to take a temperature reading and then it uses Sysbench to stress the Pi's CPU cores, factoring prime numbers for two minutes. And then it takes another temperature reading and keeps going until 20 minutes have passed. And as we can see, this has pushed power use up to what's that 5.8 watts, 5.7 watts, something like that. So we've now got a good idea of the idle and load power draw of the Raspberry Pi 500 plus. So let's now lose the power meter and speed on through the temperature test. And there we are, 20 minutes has passed and the test has finished. So let's put the results across onto the table where, as we can see, they are very impressive indeed with the large heatsink in the Pi 500 plus allowing it to run silently at a temperature range that's lower than any Raspberry Pi cooling solution I've tested. Finally, let's clear the terminal and list block devices, ls, blk, like that. And we can see here the NVMe SSD, the 256 gigabyte NVMe SSD in the Pi 500 plus. And of course, I want to test its speed. So I think I've got the command somewhere in the buffer. There it is, so let's run the test. I wonder what result we're gonna get. I know roughly what result we're gonna get. It's gonna be about 400 megabytes a second. And there we are, 418.67 to be exact, megabytes a second. 
And the reason we've got this speed is that by default, the Pi 500 Plus is running its single lane PCIe interface at PCI 2.0 speeds, because that's the speed the interface is rated for. But we can force the Pi to run its interface at PCIe 3.0 speeds, which we know from the Pi 5 works perfectly well. So let's try that. Let's bring up the command to edit the config file. There we go, and enter. And if we go all the way down here to the bottom under all, we're going to enter two new commands. There we go. And if I just press Control X, say modified yes, and there we go. And I will put that code in the video description. But if we now just close the terminal and restart the Pi, and here we are back again, we will relaunch the terminal and bring back the HD parameters command and run it again. We should now have a drive that's twice as fast. Will we have it? Yes, we've now got 808.05 megabytes a second. So if you do get a Raspberry Pi 500 Plus, I would advise, whilst it's out of specification, to run the PCIe interface at 3.0 speeds to increase the performance of the NVMe SSD. The 500 Plus is the most expensive Raspberry Pi ever sold and costs more than an entry-level mini PC and keyboard. However, the build quality is absolutely excellent and I can see this appealing to enthusiasts who want the ultimate Pi as well as people looking for a compact, silent, energy-efficient Linux desktop computer. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.